Welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. In this episode, I talk with Nicole Clark of Nicole Clark Consulting. Nicole is a licensed social worker in Brooklyn, New York. We talk about Nicole's consulting work, program design, program evaluation, strategic planning, and trainings, with an emphasis on how she keeps social justice, racial equity, and reproductive justice as her focus. Nicole shares how she decided to study social work and how she started her own business. She provides a brief overview of the reproductive justice framework. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, everybody. Here for the next episode of Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change with my guest, Nicole Clark from Nicole Clark Consulting out of New York, New York. Nicole and I go way back to grad school. So happy to have you on, Nicole. Thanks for having me. I'm hoping you could share with us a little bit about what you're doing these days. Yeah. So I'm a licensed social worker. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. I have four main services within my business. They can be done one-to-one as far as client work goes, or it could be once many, and that can be trainings and workshops and things like that. And so the first service that I provide is on program design, which is focused on a more human, human-centered approach to how we design programs and, and workshops and services. And it's also based on developmental theories, behavioral theories, current research, and also what's relevant in various types of communities. Um, the second service is program evaluation, which I tend to approach it from a more collaborative base, um, and it's focused on learning about a program and service from the client's perspective, not so much on me coming in to do um, different types of evaluative activities with clients, but also having them come along for the process as well. So they're learning about different types of evaluation activities that they can do to get the data that they need to figure out what is the impact that their program or service is having on the communities that they're serving. The third service is strategic planning. And these days, um, it's my newest service. Um, And so I'm starting to play a little bit around how I want to do strategic planning with different types of organizations. Um, And so the clients that have been coming to me to request this service, they are interested in transitioning themselves to being a more reproductive justice-led organization, or they want to incorporate different types of racial equity and community collaboration within their hiring practices, their internal structure and goals, and also just their outward facing campaigns. And the fourth service that I provide is general speaking engagements. Sometimes there are workshops or trainings, or they could also be um, panel discussions and things like that. And so I tend to speak a lot about a variety of topics, and that includes self-care, community care, incorporating racial equity into their work, feminism, reproductive justice, and things like that. And also I've been getting a lot into speaking about culturally responsive evaluation work, as well as being an ally for adults working with women and girls of color. My clients tend to be more women-led organizations or organizations that have a primary staff of people of color, or they are organizations that maybe more They may have more of a white staff, but they want to incorporate more of a racial justice lens in what they do. Many of them, they get their funding from major funders and from donations and things like that. And so we try to develop different ways for them to still be able to serve the communities that they want to serve, but also do what they can to maintain their funding, but do it in a way that is still very authentic to the, the vision of their organization and the communities that they, they want to serve. You do so many different things. You know, <laughs> I, if anyone goes to your website, which we'll put in the show notes, you know, I, there's workshops on there. You know, the revolution starts with me, keep it 100. <laughs> You've got great, great names of your workshops. Thank you. What's the biggest challenge of this work in terms of real social change for you? I think the biggest challenge is transitioning from doing the status quo to doing new things. To give an example, 
evaluation, for example, could be something that people are used to doing that's being commissioned by a funder or they're doing it as the final stage of the life of a program. And so one of the things that um, I've been finding a, to be a challenge, but also as an opportunity to work more with clients, to challenge them, to think outside the box, but as I said, also appease their funders at the same time. So think about different ways that combine evidence-based practices, but also what the community really needs in order to create a program that not only gets financial support, but also encourages more people to come back to those programs. A second thing that I would think would be a challenge would also be sort of towing the line between activism and being professional. I was reading a blog post from a doctoral student who is in, um, I believe, the Bay Area. She's in a doctoral program for evaluation. And she was talking a lot about the ethical side of being an evaluator, but also being an activist at the same time. And sometimes those things are not very you don't really combine evaluation with activism and how can you remain ethical at the same time, but, but also think of different ways to still incorporate your activism within when you're working with different types of communities. Um, I think a lot of the times, whether it's evaluation or even research, a lot of communities are very used to people coming into their communities to get data, but they don't come back. And one of the biggest challenges that I've noticed as I'm working with evaluation clients is that many of them have a history of doing that. And so one of the things that I'm doing with helping them to challenge the status quo is to help them to become more accountable to the communities that they're going into. If they go in to do research, if they go in to conduct a survey or a focus group or things like that, like how can they take that information back to the community that they went into? to help that community be more a part of the collaborative process of what they're doing. And it helps, I would say, to have more of a general buy-in from the community if organizations are able to be more responsive, culturally responsive, and also more accountable to the communities that they're serving. And so I would say that those two are the biggest challenges. One thing that you mentioned that I thought was really interesting is when you said evidence-based practice, but also what the community needs. Right. Can you just speak more about that, that comment and, you know, elaborate on that? Yeah. How can we take the research that's currently out there, but also see how is it lining up to the communities that we're serving? And also, sometimes the research may be relevant in one community, but may not be relevant in another community. So, for example, if something is more relevant in the South, with the Black community population in the South, it may not be as relevant as, say, the Black community in New York City or in Oregon or in uh, New Mexico and things like that. And so recognizing that even though people may look the same and they may come from the same community, their needs may be different. And so how can we take current research that's out there and make it more relevant to what's happening in the various communities that we're serving? Thanks. Nicole, how did you get into this work? You know, part of why I'm doing this podcast is to really capture people's stories who aren't normally highlighted. You know, some of the people who we learn about, you know, they're, they've written books or they've written, you know, research articles. We read these things when we're in school and then hopefully we keep up on it when we're <laughs> out of school <laughs> and not just for continuing education units. But I wanted to just kind of get the voices from people who are just out doing this work, you know? And so I'm really interested in how people got into this work to begin with. So maybe Mm -hmm. you could share a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I tell people all the time, but even before that, I tell people that my, my business started as a Tumblr blog, which it actually did. But even before then, I graduated from Spelman College in 2006. I got there in 2004. And my goal was to be a professional violinist. At the time, I had been playing the violin since sixth grade. And I was inspired to play the violin um, because of, I don't know if you watched Party of Five, which just that TV show that was on like back in the day. And there was a character named 
can't even remember her name, but she was the youngest out of the five siblings and she played the violin. And I was really excited about one day being a professional violinist and traveling the world and things like that. And so when I got to Spelman, I initially wanted to be a music major. But then in my sophomore year, I decided that I wasn't really sure if that's what I wanted to do. And I became an undecided major. But then I started to get involved with different types of community groups that were on campus. And one of them was the Feminist Majority Leadership group that was on campus. And I would go to the meetings. And that was when I was initially introduced to feminism um, and just overall activism. And there was an opportunity to volunteer for a conference that was going to be coming on campus of November 2003. And it was from an organization called Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. And this was their first conference, I believe. They had the first two days of the conference um, in downtown Atlanta. And then the last two days of the conference were going to be on Spelman's campus. And so I decided to volunteer because I wanted to go into the conference for free. <laughs> and my goal, <laughs> or not my goal, <laughs> my, one of my roles um, as a volunteer was to go around and record some of the workshops. And I ended up going into a workshop from a group called the Women of Color Leadership Council. And it was a group that was from Advocates for Youth, which is based in DC. And they focus a lot on championing the sexual health rights and justice of young people, um, primarily in the United States, but also globally. And I just got really inspired listening to these young women of color who were activists for not only sexual health, but with HIV and racial justice and things like that. And so I started to learn more about their work and I got really immersed into this whole activism thing, which is exciting, but also a little bit disappointing because I wasn't doing any activist work when I was in high school. And so I kind of felt that I was a little bit late in the game when it comes to activism. But now that I think about it, I think a lot of people tend to be I guess people our age tend to be more introduced to activism when they're in college and post-college. But these days, a lot of young people are starting to get exposed to activism, whether it's on campus or via social media and things like that. And so I decided to, I settled on psychology as a major. I graduated with that. And then in April of 2007, I started working for the Morehouse School of Medicine's Prevention and Research Center. And I was in the evaluation department, which I thought was very interesting at the time, learning about different logic models and and different ways to collect research and to report those findings. But I never really thought that I would actually turn it into a career until I started to apply for different types of graduate programs. And it was mostly social work and public health. Um, I applied to several schools. I decided to go to Columbia. That was my first time actually leaving the state of Georgia because that's where I'm originally from, I'm from Atlanta. And you would think that it would be a culture shock, which it wasn't for me because I moved to New York a week before classes started. And I didn't really have enough time to actually become homesick or miss my family because we were just really just jumped right into going to classes and field placements and things like that. And so when I was at Columbia, I focused on advanced journalist practice and programming. And even though it was a mixture of program development and evaluation with the clinical aspect, I knew that I was more interested in the the development and the evaluation aspect of the, the program. And so I think like a lot of social work students, unfortunately, when we we graduate, the goal is really just to get a job, even if it's not. <laughs> Got to <laughs> pay, pay those yeah. bills. <laughs> yeah, even if it's not related to your social work focus. And so I applied to a variety of places and I ended up getting hired at Housing Works. And I was a clinical case manager there in their, what is now known as Health Home. And at the time that I started working there, I had a case load of about I think under 35 people. And I would work with them on finding housing, getting them connected to different types of services. And by the time I left Housing Works, I had a caseload of, I think, a little over 80 individuals. And 
looking back on it now is very, very daunting that even though I had a, a group of people that I worked with, I was still responsible for this large group of individuals. And about three years before I left Housing Works, I started to get this idea of doing consulting. Um, I don't have a business background. I think a lot of people who I know do consulting or freelance work, they also don't have a business background, which I think more social workers or more social work programs should have more of that inside of the programming at their schools. But that's another that's another story. But I just thought that I had this interest in the rebirth of justice, evaluation, program design, and I wasn't quite sure how to make it all work. And I started to, as I mentioned earlier, how my business was originally a Tumblr blog. I started a Tumblr blog initially just to get some, just to get my voice out there when it comes to reproductive justice and feminism and how different types of current issues impact women and girls of color. And I started to get more and more of the idea of maybe I can do this full time, but I think a lot of it was just a a confidence issue. Um, like I said, I didn't have a background in business, but I knew that I had a particular expertise. And when I did my research and figuring out if there's different people who were combining rebuttal justice with program design and evaluation work, not many people were actually doing it. And so I started to put more of my face out there as not only an evaluator, but also as a social worker. And then I started to get more professional with it by like having professional headshots and, and things like that. And when I had my, my social media presence, I was using a, a different name. And then I changed it to my actual name because I wanted people to put like an actual name with the face and all that. And so I started to tell people that I was interested in getting clients. And again, I wasn't really sure exactly what that meant, but I figured once I got a client, I would be able to kind of figure out things as I went along. And I started essentially doing this as a side hustle, um, working with clients, doing blogging and things like that um, in the early morning hours. And then I would stop and get dressed and go to work. And then I would come home or sometimes go to the gym and then come home and then work my business and spend like all of my weekend working on my business. And so it worked for a while until I started to get more client work. And people who come to me now about their own interest in being a solopreneur or just to be um, a consultant or owning a business, they ask me, how do I know when it's time to make that leap, so to speak? And for me, I knew that it was time for me to make that leap because the demands that my business clients had were starting to overshadow the demands of my my clients at Housing Works. And also, I knew that I had done everything that I needed to do at Housing Works. And even still, I didn't have the self-esteem or at least the confidence to actually make that transition because... Um, with the exception of maybe one relative in my family, everyone has had a day job. They either started at it when they were very young and then they went on to retire. And I was very secretive about who I would tell this goal to. Um, I told my sister about it and I told a few friends who I knew who also had interest in going on to consulting work. And I waited until two weeks before I left Housing Works to actually tell my dad. And, and it's funny because um, my dad has been at the same organization since he was 18 and he's turning 63 this year. And so it wasn't that I was nervous that he wouldn't be supportive. It was just that I didn't know anyone else that had the same experience. Um, but of course, like many parents, they tend to to be supportive, even if they don't really understand what it is that you're trying to do. And so I knew that because I had the backing of my friends, my family, it was a lot easier for me to make that transition. And so I um, submitted my resignation to my supervisor on March 31st, 2016. And then I left the organization on May 31st. And it was, it was a very bittersweet experience because even though I was sad to be leaving the organization, I established friendships with the people that I've been working with. And part of me still felt like, even though I knew it was time for me to go, I still 
felt like I needed to learn more things, even though that wasn't really the case. I think it was just being afraid to actually make that leap. And so I remember being teary eyed when I left the building, but then once I got outside, it was just like this weight had been lifted because it felt as though I had been trying to shield my my business identity away from my coworkers. And so it felt like I wasn't in hiding anymore, so to speak. And so when I made my announcement, like told my friends on Facebook <laughs> that I had left my job, I got so much support out of it. And even throughout these years, and it's been, it's coming up on two years and I still get people who ask me about my own process and also ask me about what are the next steps. And so I, I think right now my business is still like a, like a toddler. It's right now as it is like the terrible two stages, but at the same time, it's been great to kind of take a step back and see where my business is going and not be so much in control of it. If I come across an opportunity that sounds really great and it aligns with what the vision and the focus of my business is, then I tend to be more open to that opportunity. But I try my best to continue to focus on the women and girls of color that I'm trying to reach and have the most impact with. And so um, I love still doing client work, even though my clients are no longer like clinical clients. <laughs> They're more so the executive directors and program directors. So I have a new set of clients that have more interest and demands compared to my direct practice clients. And so it's still great that I'm still doing my social work, but then a, but in a different um, capacity. Right. And you've been able to keep that core social work concept of social justice really at the forefront of your work is what, you know, is what it sounds like, which I'm sure is pretty hard to do, especially when you're running a business and you're thinking about, you know, you need to bring an income uh, for your business, which then is income for you. You know, is there anything else that you want to, you know, share while you've, while you're on the podcast? Um, I think one thing that I want to share and I've been, um, Mentioning it throughout the um, our conversation, because I'm not really sure if the audience will be familiar with the Rebirth Justice Frameworks. So I just wanted to kind of share some some little tidbits about that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Rebirth of Justice essentially is the human right to maintain bodily autonomy, uh, whether a person wants to have children or to not have kids. Um, and to be able to parent those kids in a way that is safe and sustainable to their communities. And so I think what makes RJ as a shortened so powerful for me is that um, I think that it is the, the, the gray area that ties in the, the pro-life versus the, the pro-choice movements. And I think with pro-choice and pro-life, uh, whether it's pro-abortion or anti-abortion, I think for a lot of people, it's very black or white, it's very either or, you can only choose one, but not the other. And what Reproductive Justice does, it, it shows people that if a woman chooses to have an abortion with this pregnancy, she can always go on to become pregnant and to parent another child. And so I think it also allows for me to be able to come into spaces that may be more conservative because I find that reproductive justice is a more holistic approach to how people parent and take care of um, their families. Reproductive justice was a term that was first coined in 1994 um, by a delegation of Black women who went to, I believe it was Egypt, to a human rights conference. And they were able to see how a lot of international groups were putting social justice and human rights and how they advocate for reproductive health in their, their countries and their communities. And so when the delegation came back to the United States, they coined the term reproductive justice because for Black women, and these were mostly Black women who were part of this delegation, they noticed that even though abortion rights were important to Black women, there were different things that were happening in Black women's lives that impacted what reproductive services that they were able to get. And so that includes racism, um, sexism, um, poverty, and things like that. And so what's also really great about the RJ framework is that it's very intersectional. Um, intersectional tends to be a very, like, um, 
it's a very popular term now. People want to be very intersectional in what they do. And so what's really great about RJ is that it encompasses so many different aspects of ourselves. I'm not just a Black woman. I'm a Black woman that's impacted by this, that, and the third. And so it takes into account what other aspects of ourselves that may impact how we choose to have kids or how we choose to not have kids. And so just kind of break it down a little bit to show the difference between RJ and reproductive health and reproductive rights is um, an example that I like to give is shackling of pregnant inmates when they're in labor and delivery. Um, So how that looks under the reproductive health lens is that it's unsafe for a pregnant person to be shackled while giving birth. And I believe it was the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. They have a committee that provided some guidelines for prenatal care, and that included giving special considerations for preventing pregnant people from being shackled while they're giving birth. Um, Not only does it make it difficult for women who are in bed trying to give birth, it also impacts them psychologically knowing that they're giving birth for many of them becoming first-time mothers, but also having this memory of being shackled while they're in bed. And this also impacts how providers are able to assist them because they are shackled to beds. And most women who are incarcerated are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, So why are we expecting for pregnant women to be shackled, even though majority of them are not in jail systems for violent offenses? So that's how it looks under the reproductive health framework. And for the reproductive rights framework, I believe it was a group of Democratic senators in late 2017 that introduced the Dignity for Incarcerated Women's Act, which would put a federal ban if passed on shackling of pregnant inmates. And so I believe that majority of states, I want to say around 35, 40, have some sort of ban in place. But as we know, with a lot of policies, even though they may be in place, they may not be enforceable. And so if this bill were to pass, it would make it a federal offense for pregnant individuals to be shackled while giving birth. And then to look at it under the RJ framework is really at the intersections of reproductive health and criminal justice as women of color are more likely to be incarcerated compared to white women. And so when I'm able to take a topic and kind of break it down, it makes it more palatable for people and they're able to understand how this looks under this particular framework. And it's been really interesting to not only to share my passion for RJ, but also to be in community of and get to know organizations that may have been focusing on a reproductive health way of doing things, but they're interested now in sort of shifting a little bit more towards um, the reproductive justice framework. I find that a lot of organizations are becoming more in tune with what RJ is, and not only organizations, but also Um, More young women are beginning to learn more about RJ, young men and even adult men are starting to learn more about RJ. And so I hope that we won't, we'll never have to use these terms pro-choice and pro-life again, because rebirth of justice is really at the forefront of how we're going to be able to move towards rebirth of freedom for everyone in the future. I think that's incredibly powerful and makes me think of a couple things. Number one, I don't remember anything like this ever being discussed in graduate school or undergrad. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is happening now? Do you know, are you still in touch with some of these programs in the city, you know, in New York or in other places? Do you go in and do you do talks to the, with students about this social work? I do talks, but there's also um, social workers for reproductive justice. They, we have, I want to say about 20 people who are currently on the advisory board. I'm on the advisory board also. And we have a few people who are actually working on college campuses. So they're professors. And one in particular, I believe that she started a curriculum on reproductive justice in upstate New York. I think it was the university at Buffalo School of Social Work. And so she started her curriculum. And I believe another advisory board member. She was developing her own curriculum that's based out in Chicago. And 
a friend of mine who graduated from Columbia School of Social Work a few years after we did, she's also interested in creating a curriculum to be given to Columbia Social Work School. And she and I talked about it about a year ago, but we haven't really done anything about it since then. But now that you're mentioning it, it would be a really good idea to reconnect with her and figure out how we could potentially move this curriculum forward at Columbia. Because I find that with social workers for reproductive justice, um, we do attract a lot of social work students who not only want to be social workers, but also they want to learn more about RJ as a framework and how they can incorporate it in their education. And then eventually when they go off into, when they're working at different agencies and organizations, how can they take this framework with them that they learned in school and hopefully even before that and use that into their places of work. And so one project that I'm working on right now is a combination of reproductive justice, but also program design and evaluation. And one of my goals for this project is for people to, if they choose not to work with me on a one-to-one basis, they can take this and use it as potentially a curriculum, um, especially for social work students who want to share with their other classmates about RJ and how to create a RJ focused program or curriculum and how they can share that information with not only their clients, but also with their future employers. And so I'm definitely interested in seeing how we can add more of the framework into various curriculums at social work schools. And I think that the University of Buffalo is a, is a good place to start. I am really appreciative of you coming on here on the podcast and sharing your work, your experiences, dropping some knowledge about reproductive justice. <laughs> it's an area Thank I you. need to get, it's an area I need to get better educated in. I'll, I'll admit that for sure. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for doing the work out in the community. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. Thank you.